recording. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you for logging on and attending uh, this evening's event. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to uh, message me in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can also use the chat. Uh, this program was made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. Um, with us this evening is Jennifer Rosner and Hank Philippi Ryan. Uh, the Yellow Bird Sings is Jennifer Rosner's debut novel, translated and published around the world, as Hank's holding up. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer's previously published memoir is If a Tree Falls, A Family's Quest to Hear and Be Heard. Her short writing, oh, you have them all. <laughs> her, short, her short writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Massachusetts Review, the Forward, and elsewhere. And her children's book, The Mitten String, was named a Sydney Taylor <laughs> Book Award Notable. In addition to writing, Jennifer teaches philosophy. She received her BA from Columbia University and her PhD from Stanford University. Currently, she teaches the Clement course in the humanities, a college level course for women living in economic distress. She lives in Western Massachusetts with her family. And Hank Philippi Ryan is a USA Today bestselling author of 12 mystery novels. Hank has also won multiple prestigious awards for her crime fiction, five Agathas, three Anthonys, the Daphne, two McCavities, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She is also the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV. She has won 37 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Morrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. National book reviews have called Hank a master at crafting suspenseful mysteries and a superb and gifted storyteller. Uh, Hank's novels have been named Best Thrillers of the Year by Library Journal, New York Post, BookBub, Pop Sugar, Real Simple Magazine, and others. Her 2019 book is the acclaimed standalone psychological thriller, The Murder List, a nominee for the prestigious Mary Higgins Clark Award, Agatha, Anthony, and McCavity Awards. Her newest book is The First to Lie, a chilling psychological standalone. Publishers Weekly starred review says, stellar, Hank Philippi Ryan could win a sixth Agatha with this one. And all of these books from both authors are available at Porter Square Books. Um, and Jennifer, I think we both have signed book plates in uh, all of them. So now please welcome Jennifer Rosner and Hank Philippi Ryan. Thank you so much for that. That was a very long introduction, I have to say. <laughs> but, I'm sorry. Uh, I, no, no, I love it. Of course, I embrace the whole thing. Thank you very much. On the bad writing days when I think I don't know how to do this anymore, it's always nice to hear that introduction of, you know, it has worked. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, your book, The Yellow Bird Sings, is so gorgeous and so multi-layered and so touching and so gorgeously written. Um, it's about a mother and her five-year-old daughter having to hide silently in a barn in Poland during World War II. Tell us a, a little bit more about it than that. There's so much more to it. Uh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and talking to you. So thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so there's this mother and daughter and um, the, the daughter is a musical prodigy. She can feel music pulsing inside her and she wants to, to tap and sing aloud, but she has to be completely silent. And um, she conjures a bird that can sing the song she hears in her head and her mother in order to try to pass the minutes and then hours and then days in the barn um, whispers this story about a brave girl and her bird who um, you know avert threats and find safety and it, they stay like this in the barn for quite a long while until a decision has to be made and um, and the novel goes from there. I mean you just it's 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 really um, to read this book I couldn't decide whether to race through the pages as fast as I possibly could to see what happens or just to sort of um, hold on to every beautiful word of it. Um, and, I, and I never do this, but could you, and I hope you all agree with me, could you just read the first page? It is so evocative and beautiful. Do you, everybody wants this, right? Do you want to hear this? You will, you will love it. 
Okay, there's a little bit of the yellow bird sing. Okay. The girl is forbidden from making a sound, so the yellow bird sings. He sings whatever the girl composes in her head, high-pitched trills of piccolo, low-throated growls of contrabassoon. The bird chirps all the musical parts, save percussion, because the barn rabbits obligingly thump their back feet like bass drums, like snares. The lines for violin and cello are the most elaborately composed, rich and liquid smooth, except when fear turns the notes gruff and choppy. Music helps the flowers bloom. When the daisies grow abundant, the bird weaves a garland for the girl to wear on her head like a princess, though no one can see. She must hide from everyone in the village, soldiers, the farmhouse boys, the neighbors too. The lady with squinty eyes and blocky shoes just dragged a boy down the street and returned smug and straight-backed, cradling a sack of sugar like a baby. When giants tromp past, the bird holes up in a knot in the rafter, silent and still. Tending the garden must wait. The girl, music trapped inside, buries herself under hay. She imagines her mother whispering their nightly story or whisper singing her favorite lullaby. She holds tight to her blanket and tries to fall asleep, sniffing in vain for the faded scent of home. And I don't know how you wrote this book without crying throughout. And we can talk about that in a minute. But sort of starting from the beginning, where, where did the idea for this come from? Was there a moment? There was. Um, I have to back up a little to tell you how that moment came about. So, um, so as Matthew said in, in the intro, I was a philosopher and um, doing very kind of I don't know, abstract and theoretical things. And then I had um, our first baby and she was born deaf, which was really kind of a shock. We didn't expect it given, we didn't know a family history. And, um, and then actually afterward I had a second baby who was also born deaf. So it turns out we have this recessive genetic, um, a recessive gene in our families. And um, I was, I ended up, uh, you know, I was never a creative writer. I didn't think of being a writer when I was seven. I wasn't that person. I, I was in like theoretical philosophy, but I just needed to kind of process what was happening and these kind of complex decisions we needed to make very quickly and all the kind of fraught politics and deafness and hearing. And, and I was just like writing snippets and just trying to process and journal. And eventually that became this memoir, If a Tree Falls. And I went um, on a little book tour with that with that memoir after it was published. And I was in uh, talking to a group of people and I was saying how we had made a decision for our children to try to give them access to sound with hearing technology and to encourage them to speak. And I was, our life was encouraging every vocalization. So if they would scream in the middle of a library or a bookstore or whatever, we were happy. I mean, everyone else like glared at us, but we were so happy if they were making sound. And, um, and then as I was describing our celebration of their sound, this woman in this audience mentioned her childhood experience. She was hidden in a shoemaker's attic with her mother during World War II and she had had to be completely silent for, for months really. And I just, I, I don't know, she had, you know, I was thinking about her mother kind of with the opposite enterprise of, you know, hushing and silencing and maybe getting her child to vanish where we were like trying so hard to kind of get our children to speak. And I just couldn't sort of stop thinking about that. And I ended up interviewing her at, at length. And then from her, I met several other hidden children. I kind of ended up immersed in the world of hidden children. These are, you know, adults, some very old, but who were hidden as children. And they all had really different stories, all of them full of so much like resilience and strength and um, ingenuity. And, and that's kind of how it all started. And it's so interesting that the universe, how, however you think of it, um, provides you the perfect person with the perfect story um, not only to help you understand deafness, but also silence and sound and communication and mother-daughter relationships and what we owe each other and when to when you can and how much sound plays a role in our lives. Um, all all those things and imagination and beauty. Um, how did you 
So, so, so you have this mother and daughter in the, in, the, in the hay barn. You can almost, even from that beginning, you can s smell that loss and smell the um, environment of, of the hay. Um, how did you come to that particular girl's story? I think actually, so this is my first novel and it took me a very, very long time. And I, I feel like maybe for really three years straight, I was, all I had was this girl and her mother in a barn. I mean, people were like, how's it going? And I, I'd be like, I don't know. I've got this girl and mother in a barn. And um, I was on page 11 really for like three years and the, the 11 pages kept changing, but it was always just this, this thing. And one thing that dawned on me later was you know, we all and bring like different strengths to to writing, and um, I think you know it, it seems very clear that you know plot is something you're really amazing at, and that plot isn't necessarily like a strength for me, but sensory sure. experiences. And I think I get this by being a, from being a mom of deaf children, where we paid so much attention to every detail and drew attention to every sound. So any rustle, I hear that. And, a fr you know, the sizzle of a pan, I hear that. Do you hear that? So we were doing that work and it just made me so conscious of all the sounds and all like what things really look like when you're paying close, close attention and feel like. And, you know, because our daughters would hold like a balloon at a concert because the vibrations were, you know, kind of, f you know, felt this way. And um, so it's just interesting. I think that that barn situation came from, I don't know, wanting to be, everything was very slow and we were just paying attention. But in the, you know, it's just such an opposite thing though, because in the book, sound is, is so terrible and so deadly. If, if anyone hears them, their lives are over. Um, and so True. she has to, and so she has to create sound that only she can hear. When in your life, you know, sound is life, sound is progress. Um, as a, as a mom and as a writer and as a philosopher, how do you think of that? Well, how do you think about that? I mean, what yeah, I mean, there's a lot that when I, that has kind of gone on in, in like when you look at the trajectory of my work. And um, I think that one thing that's interesting is you know, when we had, when our children were born deaf and, and um, I, I, there were things I ended up looking at. One thing was our ancestry and we found these two great, great aunts in the shtetl in Austria who, from all I could tell um, after doing a lot of research and then talking to a lot of family, the kind of most meaningful story I got was that um, when these women had babies of their own, they tied a string from their wrist to their babies so that when the baby cried at night, they would feel the tug in the dark, you know, and they'd wake to care for their child. So they had created this innovation of hearing by tying this string to feel where they couldn't hear. But what was interesting is that at the same time I was, I was so happy to be finding this model, I think I also felt that I didn't really have a model for hearing in my own life. Like my mom, ha she actually did have a different kind of hearing loss, not, not genetic, but it was kind of both literal and it was both metaphorical and literal. And, and so there, there were ways in which I felt unheard as a child. And when it all boiled down, you know, we were trying to get our children to hear, but truthfully, I realized that the whole mission was whether I would hear them. And um, it kind of all turned on its head. So I wanted to know if I could be that person who would be able to really attend to them when I didn't feel I had been so much attended to. And uh, with the exception of music, which is where kind of things change, because I am a trained opera singer and my dad played violin every day of his life. And my mom, who did have trouble attending, everything stopped and she listened when I sang. It was just like the one area of our lives where her attention just stayed really focused when I sang. And I think I made music this connective tissue between the child and her family, not just her mom, who also was a musician, but her father and her grandfather was a violin maker. So um, there were all these things, but sound plays such a role in, I guess, my own life. Um, the making of the sound, the feeling silenced in certain ways, the worry that our children wouldn't speak, um, that they might never hear, that they would, you know, how would they make phone calls? How would they make friends? I mean, you know, all the kind of things that were happening. And then hearing of this child who had to be silenced but knowing there's something, oh, there's so much inside wanting to come out and then giving her this yellow bird that could sing the song she, you know, felt inside her, you know, it was just, I don't know, you know, I think it was like the meat of my life, the material I've been grappling with for so long. And to, but, you know, when you have this situation, you not only 
have the hiding, but the reason they're hiding, yes. which is another level of your book altogether, which you wouldn't have had to have done. How did you I know. Poland and Nazi Germany? How, yeah, how, how exactly. Did you I know. That? I mean, it, it's a, it was, it's an interesting thing. I, you know, and it's funny as a writer to make a choice to write a World War II story when it's a kind of glutted market. And some people are like, I just don't want to read another Holocaust book. And there are things like that are deterrents from doing so. Um, and one could have found this scenario of a hidden mother and child in other historical moments. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that ultimately I, be, first I had met that hidden child of the Holocaust and my father's music is this, uh, the stuff he composed and played, I felt was like this way of finding his own Jewish rootedness. Uh -huh. And um, and it was my heritage. Like it, it kind of, I was thinking of ways of maybe I should avoid, <laughs> avoid this scenario, but in a way I realized like it's the one that makes most sense for me. And, um, you know, and upon meeting that one hidden child and then the others and hearing how they how they made it through these scenarios it was so much um incredible creativity and appreciation for beauty and all these things that played roles in their survival um i don't know i just well i was like this is my story this kind of makes sense as the story i tell yeah, it totally completely makes sense i mean it does make sense but it's so beautiful and so tough and must have um required you um unlike so many other stories might have really required you to go deep into you that is the that is the place where you would find this. Was that um, intimidating or was it rewarding and blossoming? Do you, you came out, yeah. you came out the other end. I mean, you're yeah. not silent about this anymore, any of that. Um, how did that change you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I really connected to the people I interviewed and it tapped into something um, in, inside me and also connected me to my family in a way that I may never have felt so connected. Um, and so I think it was really a nourishing process as m the writing I've done that's creative writing has all felt very nourishing as opposed to the theoretical <laughs> analytic philosophy, uh, which didn't feel all that nourishing. Um, it felt somewhat detached, um, but the- that's, but this, out, that's out, that's in looking out and now you're out looking in is what you right. might do for this. Yeah, exactly. This is like, you know, returning to what is very personal psychological material and letting it take whatever form in some creative way where you're not really tracking. I mean, one reason maybe also it took me so long is that I was just kind of writing, you know, I was just like everything, I was just letting it come out and um, it wasn't constrained by, by anything really. I think the story emerged over time. So it was really um, a little bit of a, you know, it was like a window in to my, <laughs> to my unconscious mind. You know, um, I, don't, I don't use an outline at all when I write. Um, and it's, I don't know what's going to happen next until I write the next sentence or the next paragraph or the next scene. And that sort of emerging story. And sometimes I think, oh, is that what happened? Oh, okay, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. so interesting. And I go to the computer every day to see what happened. Do, yeah. Is that how you do it or do you? Yeah, that's how it's been for me. And I think it is, that's maybe why it feels nourishing because you're tapping into things you may not even be very aware of, but you're expressing things that need to come out. So um, I think this is, um, I don't know what I love so much about having found, I found writing really late, you know, I was like nearly 40 when I found out that I love writing. Um, and so, it, but it's just been such a thrill to be able to do that kind of work. Well, I do think, um, I mean, I started writing fiction I've been a television reporter for 43 years, but I started writing fiction when I was 55, which was 15 years ago. And I, and I couldn't have done it if I had started sooner. I mean, I, I'm, I insist that the things like that happen when it's time for them to happen. Um, but let's talk about um, uh, some other of the themes and some other of the techniques that you use in the book. Music, for instance, my dad, and I know we're cousins, I know we are. <laughs> Um, my father was the music, the music critic for the old Chicago Daily News in Chicago and was a, um, a, 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 not a professional pianist, but a classical pianist, very highly trained and played the piano every day of his life. Um, and this music um, really was what con connected him. And he um, started to lose his hearing at, late in life. And that was very upsetting, you know, as you can imagine, very upsetting. So you chose to write about music, a thing that the reader can't hear. 
how did you do that? How do you think about writing music that you need someone to hear? Yeah, and people have asked, like, where's the playlist? <laughs> and some people have said, I actually went on and found those pieces and played them as I read, which I think is really a wonderful thing to do. Um, I mean, one thing that I'd like to answer with this is how did I, how did I come to understand how a musical prodigy would <laughs> would, would play and practice and, and how to describe this music. So, um, I mean, it kind of links to all the different kinds of research I did for the novel. So, in, you know, in addition to, um, you know, interviewing a lot of hidden children in these various different cases, um, I went to Poland and Tel Aviv and I actually met this violin maker, Amnon Weinstein, who's kind of an amazing guy who has rebuilt violins from the Holocaust and they're played around the world in these orchestras. And when the violin, you know, if, if a single player is playing an instrument like that, wearing it down according to their own body, their own fingers pressing on it, then later when this instrument is played at this concert, it's like, re, it's like bringing back this voice of this lost player. It's really amazing and very touching. And, but, but, you know, in the course of research, you know, I was consulting with Holocaust historians and nuns and mushroom trackers and and also like forest, um, you know, how to walk through a forest without making um, any 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 um, visual uh, breaks in the pattern, etc. But the main person was this master class violinist named David Russell, who I don't know, I started reading about Violence for Hope and I saw his name, David Russell, he was here, it was in North Carolina, and I wrote to him and said, I want my novel to be really true to life. I I need help. And he was the most generous, amazing guy. And he read several drafts. He consulted with me on which pieces she would play in which order, what it would feel like to practice. I, there are things that didn't make it in where I said, tell me what it would be like, you know, her hand is sweating on the board, like uh, everything about what it would be like for this girl. And he really embraced it. Um, and it was, it was really quite fun to be in touch with him. And um, I, I also worked with a musicologist who, I don't know, just to hear what the stories might be underneath the music and make, I mean, I wrote those, I invented those stories, but to kind of see the way in which the music moves to bring a story. And so all those things are things that I feel like I kind of picked up or learned by either consulting or listening and listening and listening and listening. And so my father who played violin every day, he was probably not the best violin, you know, he wasn't, he was no master violinist. Um, he was a kind of dogged and committed violinist <laughs> um and um you know he he's he played certain pieces over and over um so it was and i needed to get a real education in sort of another repertoire altogether like an expert repertoire really um and this violinist really helped me with that and um and then i think you know when you're writing about music but you're tying it into your character who you end up knowing so well and the themes of the novel it kind of those stories of the music sort of I don't know, they kind of grew organically from the stories that are in the text. And I mean, there's something else, which is that, you know, like when I, when I've given, I gave her a yellow bird and um, there's a way in which by her having this story about a yellow bird, but her mother also telling a story about a girl and a bird, it connects them all together. So they're all sharing. Because if people might not know this, um, there's just two sort of yellow, well, many yellow bird elements, many, 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 but two of the basic yellow bird elements. She has this imaginary creature who is sort of her conscience and her guide and her fairy godmother and mentor and experience and all, the, all those words. Um, and then, and so I want to talk about that. I mean, children sometimes have imaginary friends. Um, sometimes they just eat the ha eat half the sandwich. Other times, you know, they're creating for them and protecting them. How did you decide to give her a bird? And then let's talk about the mom and the stories. Yeah, um, I mean, initially, I I wanted her to have comfort in the barn. I wanted her to have a voice that she couldn't have, and the bird because she was musical could be the voice that she could express. The bird can sing, the, it's safe. Bird song is safe. 
um, though her own voice isn't. And so that was kind of how that all began. Um, I also found that as a writer, having this bird gave me this ability to add subtext to the novel when at times I was stuck in a five-year-old's point of view. Yeah. So, you know, all you can, you're just there and that's all you can know and it's all you can express. And if she's not aware of it, you can't be saying it either. But having this bird who can like peck if it's anxious or um, you know, hop around when it's angry and bury itself low. I mean, I got to express things that um, I couldn't necessarily have expressed as well if I had only had the child's point of view. So this bird, I didn't really understand how it would be at the time. I mean, I didn't give it to her for a strategic reason like that, but it turned out as a writer to be very helpful. And um, do, you know, do you know five-year-old girls? Did you, I mean, talk, you interviewed hidden children. Children. Hidden, I mean, my, so my daughter had these three imaginary friends, which we oh, still, okay. we still have a conversation about sometimes because their names were kind of funny. And, um, and she was really serious about that. I mean, she, she wouldn't be on the swing because they were on the swing and, you know, we, <laughs> there was a lot going on about, about those imaginary friends. So I think I was used to that, but um, I also wanted the, existence of the bird at times to feel like you question like is it an actual maybe there's a little yellow bird that like flew into the barn for real um because i because for the girl who has an imaginary bird it really does seem real to them like i wanted it to feel ambiguous you know i wanted it, you to be so convinced that she believes in the bird she kind of believes thing. it she believes yeah. it so maybe i mean there's a scene where um, where she's confronted with a with a person in the schoolyard at one point, and she says the bird wants to peck her eyes out, or something like that. And right. that you know, that sort of conscious and alter ego was such yeah. a such a wonderful way of showing how how connected they are. But the mother and daughter, I mean, imagine I know you have the imagine being in a barn with Nazis surrounding you, and that in your first scene with the, with the woman you know, turning in the person and coming back with the sack of sugar, like a baby, which is again, astonishingly chilling. Um, what a mother must feel, the daughter doesn't, almost doesn't know what she's being protected from, but the mother does. Yeah. Um, and I, I tried also, you know, it was a, I had to do a lot of thinking about how much this mother was going to share with the child at a at five and how risky it would be for the girl to really know the circumstances and also how corrosive knowing the circumstances might be to her sense of self. And so a mother's decision to kind of keep it vague and try to make, you know, try to pass the time and make it through. And one thing that really affected me is so I was, so, you know, mostly I, I could only really meet with, you know, these adults who were children um, when they were hidden, but their families by now were, were gone. And so I couldn't talk to a mother who had hidden a child. And, but this one hidden child said to me, he's actually this amazing man. He's a um, Nobel Prize winning chemist at Cornell now, um, really incredible guy. He lived with his mother and aunt and uncle in this school attic while outside the kids were actually at play and he was stuck in this attic looking through the slats. His mother had this atlas from the school and she would be quizzing him like, if you had to go from Odessa to Warsaw, what route would you take? And teaching him how to read all this incredible stuff. And he actually said to me that his experience was like a cocoon of love, which is an unbelievable you wouldn't testament that, would you? Yeah. to his mom. I mean, how did she make that feeling for this child under these circumstances? Yes, and, that um, brought tears to your eyes. I mean, that's how difficult would that be not to let your own terror come out and not to let that sort of in infect, infect your child? And I mean, I wanted this mother to be a round person. And there were times when she lost it and times when she was, you know, really creative and, and, and like innovative and great. But like, I wanted it to be the gamut of things because I, I can only imagine. You well, know. she's a grown up. I mean, she is going to think those things. But the other thing you, another, yet another thing that you delve into so beautifully is um, sort of how we as human beings are the only creatures that can make something out of nothing. You can make a story that never existed before, and, you know, and sort of Scheherazade, like, keep someone interested in a thing that's, that is not real. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, I was thinking what you were talking about, the, 
your relatives with the string and feeling it and that bond that connection part of that is in is in the stories tell about tell yeah about i know in fact i do at some point as the mother is desperately trying to explain that they'll need to be apart but they're gonna always be together be together in their hearts and she says you know there's just you know imagine we have this invisible string between us you know of, or a daisy you know because they had brought daisies and um and the girl's like that's not gonna happen it, we're gonna trip over it. it's gonna tear you know like all the kind of realistic <laughs> worries and the mom is at this point trying to use a creative mechanism you know to make the separation okay but um yeah i mean i think one thing that happened was as i talked to those hidden children I was just so struck by the ways in which like creativity and also beauty played a role in their survival. So one thing, like I remember talking to one person who just, they could barely keep going and then they like caught the vanilla scent of tree bark out when they were in the woods and it like somehow regrouped them and they were able to keep going this tiny thing, you know, um, but it was like beauty in the world, recognize, being able to see beauty, even when you're on this brutal, terrible situation. And I think yeah. that in a way, those stories are like that, being able to, to, to conjure that there are moles and one wears glasses and like just these little stories that would like show, I don't know, a reservoir of, of hopefulness or ingenuity and creativity. And it's also making, she's, allowing her daughter's mind to work as well as her own mind. She's, you know, if, 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 if they can't have sound, they can have imagination, they can have sight in their mind. And so to sort of cultivate the capability of doing that, you know, is so beautiful. You know, quickly, um, my, as I said, my dad, my dad was um, in the Battle of the Bulge. And we, um, Years and years and years and years later, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we were in Lenox. We always go to Lenox in the, in the summer. And we went in the, in the house we were renting, there was a book of one of the, the Lewis Untermeyer, one of those little, you know, uh, paperback anthologies of poetry. And in this person's house, and my dad pulled it from the shelf and he said, oh, this is the same edition of poetry that I took with wow. me, in the, that I took with me in the war. And I said, he said, I carried it with me everywhere. He was in the artillery. And I, I said, you, you carried a book of poetry with you in the war? I mean, he was in a German prison camp. And he said, I said, why did you do that? And he said, to remind myself there's beauty in the world. You know, wow. and it's the same, you know, it's the, that same need to yes. hold on to something that isn't terrible. And I think that people would carry their sheet music. They carry things that seem ridiculous. You have to walk through swamps and go across whatever, hide in the woods and they're carrying their sheet music or something. It's the same thing. It's like the part of being human that, you know, that makes humanity, you know, something. And I feel like um, I've heard of that. I've heard of that many times and it felt so inefficient or weird, but it also made complete sense in order to survive. I, we just don't know what we'll do, but I, and I love the, the bravery that you showed um, in trying to evoke for us a, a something that might have been real. I mean, I, I, the idea that you found these hidden children and decided to create your own, your own world about this. You were talking about, I mean, you went to Poland, you talked to musicians, you talked to hidden children. What other things did you find, did you discover yeah. that you put in the book? I mean, I should just mention about my trip to Poland that I found a guide in, a, in advance on, online, which, you know, was a little dicey just to try to <laughs> find someone who's going to drive you way out into the countryside, very, you know, into these like remote areas. But he was also, um, he had been someone who worked in the Poland Museum as well. And, and he, he was offering that he would read my manuscript in advance and then take me to where I needed to go, which was such an amazing thing. And he did. Yeah. And he took me to, you know, this area of farmland um, where you got to see, first of all, you know, when you think of a farm, you think of a lot of land and somewhat some privacy, but these farms were in these like narrow swath, swaths of land. So you'd have like the farmhouse and the barn and then this long sort of narrow swath of field right next to your nearest neighbor who also went, their field went all the way back. So the houses were sort of close together, which makes sense as a community matter. 
um, but they had very little privacy. And even when we were there visiting um, the guide, I brought my eldest daughter with me. She wanted to come. And um, she, we, he brought us one day to see this beautiful Orthodox church. And he, um, he turned, you know, in our car left instead of right, whatever. He turned us, brought us to church and back. And some, one of the people in our little town where we're staying a couple nights goes, so why did you turn left instead of right? Like we were being watched as... <laughs> well and I thought wow you know you know how are you gonna hide someone in your barn like yeah. pe people are noticing your every move here um he also took us to a convent and he showed this place where you know Jewish children had been hidden there was like a partition and they went under and when I got there you know it was like there was mushroom soup you could smell and there like you could feel how your feet would hit the floor I mean all these sensory experiences were really meaningful to me and and then the thing that my daughter still like holds against me is that I said we have to go to the forest in winter like we're, we went in December it was freezing cold <laughs> this dense like primeval forest but I needed to know like how how this would go you know and these were forests that partisans had camped in and they survived for years in this frigid landscape which was unbelievable so there was all that kind of stuff and I guess I should also say like I, I think, I'm sure you know this, like sometimes like truth is stranger than fiction. And um, one person I interviewed had said to me that, so before things got crazy, they had a little bunker like attached to their home. And later they were all dispersed and separated and everything got bombed, but they would go at dangerous moments down into this bunker and they had a goose and they fed the goose on this little porcelain dish and um, like this pretty pattern dish. And so, this woman told me that, you know, at one point her father had said he tried hiding money, he hid money in this little pipe outside the, bar, you know, sort of in the bunker. Uh, several years later, she tried to go to the place where this bunker would have been. It was complete rubble. She found this teeny shard of the pattern of the dish that her goose ate off of and then from there found this pipe and found the money no. and I and she and I said if I had tried to pass this on to my editor as like part of my story she'd be like that's ridiculous I mean it's way too <laughs> that would never happen etc and meanwhile this sometimes this kind of stuff happened and um I was always just astonished by it but you know I after listening to all these stories I really set them all aside and tried to write one that's totally different because I kept feeling that maybe they'd write their own story or maybe Maybe their children will write their story. I wanted to leave their stories. But there is this one little reference that this person brings their goose along to the kibbutz. I just had to add it because well, that's, like, that's <laughs> an homage to. Right, yeah. exactly. I was going to say, that's just in honor of it. That's not Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't steal that's just. Did you get under hay and straw to see what it would feel like? Uh, I didn't. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I probably should have. I was there with my hands in this freezing landscape. Why well, didn't I yeah. bury myself under hay? Well, I think having rabbits, I know a lot about hay and what it is. Exactly. <laughs> and it's and attributes. About, and about rabbits. And about yeah. rabbits. Yeah. You know, the, um, you were talking about how you write and how, um, how the words come to you. And you were always, already, you had said that you were on page 11 for like 35 years. Or whatever. <laughs> whatever. I know the feeling. I, I know the feeling. Um, but do you, what is your, what are your secrets? I mean, every, we all have our own, but for what, do you write every day? Do you make a plan? Do you have a word yeah. count? How do you do that? I don't have a word count. I, I try to be very gentle because I, I don't know, you know, sometimes you go on Facebook and people are like 10,000 words a day and you're like, you're like wow. Um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's not my thing. I'm very slow. And um, I, my, my way is to just try to show up every day. If I can show up every day, it will keep simmering. If I show up every day, I might wake up with a thought. If I, <laughs> or if I step in the shower, like I might have a thought, but if I don't touch it every day, I will not have a thought. Like I, it's like I, I can, it. I can detach that way. And so for me, it's like just staying present to it is really important. I don't say I need this many hours or I need this many words. I say I need to touch this every day. Every day is different. We have two children, they have issues, you know, whatever stuff comes up, but they're all home half the time. You know, this is all this has been happening and the virus is its own subject and how we both have function during that. But but even before that, I, you know, I'm on call in a lot of ways. And I'm also teaching and um and so I just felt like if I just show up every day, eventually this thing will happen. And I think that kind of faith is helpful 
for people who are trying to get through a long haul project. You know, um, I remember in philosophy grad school, it was so hard to never see the fruits of your labor. I mean, you know, you'd be working and working and there's nothing to show for it. And I started doing things like building shelves you know, yeah. <laughs> or like making pottery, you know, just, just to say like, this is some little thing. But of course, you know, even with the pottery, it's like, I take this piece of pottery and I say, I'm going to make a big vase. And then I come out and I'm like, it's a wasabi dish. Like, it's, yeah. like, it's like it's this mix. Of, I, I've had to adjust to understanding that I'm slow and things go in small little but steps. You know what, in writing, you know, it's, if you, it's math. It's, if you write every day, a, li right. like, a little bit that in it inexorably will happen. Yeah. That's I, true. I, I read How do you, what's your process? I'd like to hear. The same. It's the same. I mean, I, I say to my husband sometimes before we go to sleep, I'll say, I'm just going to go say goodnight to the book, you know, yeah. and I just open the manuscript and I just see where I am and I be in the world. I remember what it's yeah. about. You know, it's a, you know, I also say if I have all I need is one good idea a day, just one yeah. good idea a day. And that's really hard to do. You know, I know. Good idea. Um, but then somehow you, sometimes you, and I wonder if this happened to you. And I wonder what if, I wonder what it was like. So you, ha it's almost method acting when I'm writing. I'm being the person. So you're in these points of view. How, how did that change you feeling like a hidden person or feeling like the mom or feeling like the girl? How did, how did, how did you, how were you when you wrote those? Well, I actually want to say that I think it was an other direction. I think that what happened is there's ways in which I felt hidden and they showed up on the page. Oh. So I think it came from inside me to them, not from them to me so much. Like, I think there's ways in which I really identified with each of these, not, you know, there might be some with whom I didn't identify as much with, but the mother and daughter definitely identified very strongly with both sides because I think I've longed as a daughter to be connected to my mother and I've longed as a mother to have connection with my children. And those longings are kind of like the thing that really like undergird this novel. Um, there's just this so much longing to be back together, you know, to be, to have this connection and forge it in whatever way you can. So I think that um, those things came from like my own deep psychology and then kind of got transformed to fit those characters. And when, when you, when you think of, for instance, all the wonderful people who are at this event, going to Porter Square Books and buying your book online, which we'll put up the, put up the link. Um, how do you want them to understand the world? I mean, you had to delve into Nazis in World War II and the horrible inhum man's inhumanity to man and how things that, you know, yeah. are just unthinkable happened and not in, it's not history, it was then. I mean, it was, they were in this and how do they deal with that? And how do you see, did, how did that change you and your view of the world? I think that one thing that happens as a writer is, for me anyway, is that you start seeing things in a way, in a round way, because you understand that each of these people is, is a full round human who has, you know, qualities of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important about my novel that, you know, there are people who do bad things in my novel, and then they also do nice things they show kindness, you know, this, I don't know, I don't know if I'm spoiling or not spoiling, but there's a, you know, a farmer who's, who's, you know, taking advantage of the mom in the barn. And he's also bringing socks and potatoes and they're risking their family. And there are nuns who are mean, but then they are also very scared. And, um, you know, I guess one thing as a philosopher, you know, I've studied this thing called moral luck, which has a lot to do with you know, we hold people responsible often for things they're not actually in control of. And one of the things often is our circumstances Our, you know, we have, we have our constitution, we're not always in control of this, but we expect people to behave in certain ways. And um, the circumstances of our action, we, you know, if someone runs in front of your car, if someone runs quickly in front of your car, um, and you know, you're you, whatever, it's like sometimes circumstances happen, and yet you're blamed anyway, because, you know, it happened, and you were the actor in this event. Um, but if you had driven home the same in a number, you know, as, as recklessly or as not recklessly, and no kid ran in front, you would not be held accountable. Like, there's all these things in our life that we end up judging ourselves and other people based on things. So one of those things I feel like is, you know, I've never been 
I mean, we judge, but there are challenges we've never faced and there are, there are, we've never, we've never been tested. Yeah. Well, you know, so, so, so like, what would you do if it were you? Well, that's a hypothetical. And we yeah. hope, we always hope, of course, we want to be the upstanding person. We want to be the one who would rescue. We want to be the kind person. We wouldn't be evil. <laughs> um, and then the, but we're not tested. And so we, not, no one has to know the answer for us. Um, but so, I don't know. I think what happened is, I just think it, what happened is all of the characters became so rounded. And I think that was good. Like the good, the good aren't only good and the bad aren't only bad. And that's how our life is and our world well, that's is. Real I mean, do you, it sounds like you, you know more about your characters than it's, than is in the book. Always. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and also there's like hundreds on the cutting room floor too, right? <laughs> um, decisions to make. Away. <laughs> right. And um, all there, I think I wrote at all 30 years of this novel and there's this jump of 20 <laughs> that aren't in the book. You know, we, we ended up going back in and like, you know, the, the, my editor said a few things that was, were interesting. You know, first she was like, I feel like the heart of the story is really in the barn. But also she said, you know, I can't even deal with my children for one snow day and they can be loud and eat whatever they want. And how is this person getting through in this barn for, you know, hundreds of days, you know, where they can't make a sound and they, they're hungry and, you know, all this can't move. And some people left their hidden places and they could literally their bodies were bent and unable to move. They had to rehabilitate. They were atrophied. I mean, there were so many things that happened, but how did they manage to get through? Are they, their teeth are in spongy whatever's because of all the malnutrition? And and so, yeah. Um, and I think now, you know, that we're all in this hideous pandemic situation. And I heard a teenager on the news say something like, how am I supposed to go to school if I have to sit in front of a computer at home for six hours a day? And I thought, yeah, you can probably do that. But, yeah, you know, yeah. make up a cup of co a cocoa and put, you know, put on your fluffy slippers and, exactly. you know, exactly. you'll be fine. I mean, it's hard. And of course, people are, are very sick and, and, and some people are, are very sick. And I, I mean, it's a, it's a hard situation, but I, I know it's like, it's been interesting because I think that in some ways, my novel is timely for, well, it's, it's actually timely for many reasons. Um, but as regards the pandemic, you know, just the feeling of isolation and the feeling of being secluded and kind of stuck in is and something you know, resonant. And it's not like, you know, initially I thought, well, it's like a blizzard. I'll just pretend it's like a blizzard and we can't go out. And facing the reality of just as your characters in the book, if you, if you go outside, you could die. And so then you think, well, I'm really lucky. I live here you know, right outside of Boston and this is my office and this is very nice and we have food and I love my husband. And so let's just count our blessings. And I, and I wonder if your mother and daughter characters, you know, you, you make the, it's a sort of a, uh, a lesson in how you make the best of what you have because you sort of get this one life. Yeah. Yeah, and sort of the key to making it through, I think, is, is I'm sure that in a way, the people I spoke to are the people who survived, and they survived because they had an, a certain frame of, you know, they, 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 they and their families saw life a certain way, like a way to keep pushing, to be yeah. resilient, to be creative, to, to you know, to, to take the beauty where you can find it, all those sort of things. So... Um, I'm, I'm just looking to see whether there are questions. I, if you would, if, oh, we're wrapping up and I, I've, we've just been talking and talking and I'm just <laughs> riveted by what Jennifer's saying. And I thought, wait, maybe somebody has questions. If anybody has questions, put them in the chat um, or put them in the question thing. Do we have a QA and a thing? No, just put it, um, put them in the, put them in the chat or wave your hand like crazy and I'll call on you and we can, I'll just unmute you if I can do that. Um, do you, you would, Jennifer, you'd be, you and I would both be on book tour now, if not for the pandemic. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, it was dis very disappointing initially to feel that it all, all kind of shut down. My, actually, you know, yes, or launching into this kind of virtual <laughs> circumstance. Um, but I also feel that I've gotten to connect to readers that I wouldn't have, you know, I might not have had, you know, this or that event. And now I was, and, um, you know, I got to do like a book club in London and someone in New Zealand. And like, there've been really fun things that I never could have 
travel to. So some silver linings. How about you? How have you felt? Exactly the same, you know, exactly the same. I would have been packing my suitcases and printing out boarding passes and, you know, gallivanting all over the country and, you know, having chocolate chip cookies and tea in my hotel room. And it's glamorous to be on book tour, crazy, but glamorous. Yeah. Um, but there actually, it turned out to be that there were some reasons that it was really good that I was home. Yeah. Um, so you just, you just don't know. Yeah. I think Judith, did you have a question? Let me see if I can unmute you. Oh, you're just applauding. Oh, yay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's, we love that. Anybody else have the, we'll always take applause. Thank you. Um, anybody else have a question? Everybody's very quiet. Well, there, I don't see people, there's so many people who are not on, on video. So if you had a question and the chat's hard for you, join mm -hmm. by audio so we can see if right you here. need to. Good idea. Good idea. These are the people who decided that they're just going to wear like, you know, my sweatpants and my flip flops underneath yeah. the desk. No, no judgments from me. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. Exactly not. There was a person um, on one of the events that I went to. Uh, I'm looking to see whether this is going to happen here. No, she. Um, I think people forget that they're on camera, and this woman had a, you know, a blender. You know, the the oh. jar that's in the blender. <laughs> that you make margaritas or smoothies in and she had the whole jar and she was drinking from the jar <laughs> and i thought i can see you i i, I can see you doing that <laughs> um are you so where um how are people receiving your book what are they saying to you i know you must get so many emails from people who are just so touched by it i have gotten the loveliest notes from people and the ones that have made me the happiest actually are the hidden children who I interviewed and then I sent the first, I got a box of books and I mailed them all out to those people I interviewed and they all, you know, read them. And then I got these letters back and I think, I feel so happy that they, they are the ones who feel, you know, like who, that they're being happy that it's out there, that there's a story like this, that, that it was, you know, they felt it was a beautiful story. It really made me happy, but it's happy. It's always nice to hear from anyone who likes your novel, but that has they, been did so they, rewarding. Did they seem to, did they think you got it somehow, that you tapped into something that was real? Yeah, in fact, several of them said I had so much trouble at just reading through the segment of the barn. Um, and I mean, there were challenges later, you know, because there were name changes and loss of the thread of identity and, you know, how you get off a train and there's just like tags of paper ruffling in the wind and you don't know where your family is. I mean, all that stuff was very hard. So I think it really brought brought up uh, a lot of what, um, you know, was painful in their lives. But I think they also, I don't know, be, I think because of the music and the bird and the connection between the mother and daughter, I mean, I think they really also felt they just really liked it. So it well, you know, it's, it's their history and it's their story. And they, and I have to say, you know, they must have felt that they were heard. Yeah, that I hope so. I hope so. I feel very connected to them, you know, from having had these conversations and, and wanting their, you know, these, the wanting like the ingenuity that they brought to their circumstances to be known, you know, because that's the other thing is like, you know, it's a world, it's a Holocaust novel in some ways, but it's not, I mean, it's really a different kind of thing. And I think that there's always sort of these dominant narratives um, when, when people, you know what I mean? Like overall you start reading and you sort of get these dominant narratives, but um, this one feels like more of specific to the group of people who have been hidden and, um, you know, who actually get, there are these hidden children conferences once every other year. And there's, you know, sort of groups of people who have experienced this hiddenness and. But it's still, it's motherhood and connection. Exactly. And music and imagination. And yeah, it's broader. And resilience and survival, no yeah. matter, no matter what's what the setting. Is. Yeah. Jennifer, you are, you're amazing. It's just been, it's been so lovely to talk with you and your book, The Yellow Bird Sings, I'll try to make it show up here nicely, is, is, is eloquent and lovely and um, immersive and beautiful. And I hope um, the, the, um, the link is up on the chat. I hope you will all click on that and get Jennifer's. And wonderful. also yours. I, I, I feel this, you know, this interview was set up sort of you know about my story but I but Hank's book is amazing and you should oh. definitely be going to to uh, Porter Square Books and looking us up. Thank you. I would, next year we'll go in person. 
that would be amazing together in person i, would um, love I that. want to thank you carrie library for inviting us and having us here tonight what a wonderful event it is and i hope you all enjoyed it matt i'll send it back to you and jennifer thank you thank you okay. thank you both for for coming and, and doing this and thank you everyone for attending as well um do you the recording will be up um probably tomorrow um, I know you, when Zoom ends, it just we just all vanish. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, it, you know. It's so strange. Do yeah, you so do you both all. of you do both of you want to stay for a moment after just to recap and sure, once everybody sure. leaves? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all again. Thank you all. Thank you. Just wait a minute. Oh, you get the applause. Thank you, Judith. <laughs>